Hello. Hey, how are you? Oh, well, same, same as you. Yeah, not doing a lot. Groundhog's year. <laughs> Hi, I'm Angie Martosio. I'm a staff writer here at Rolling Stone, and I just had an awesome conversation with Joe Walsh, where we talked about his upcoming veterans charity concert, the legend behind Life's Been Good, and how he would have been a better president than Donald Trump. So what have you been doing in quarantine? Like, what are your days like? It's kind of a blur at this point. <laughs> yeah. If I get into the drama of it all and the fear and the anger, actually, but the fear of the great unknown that lies ahead of us, all of that stuff just enables negative thinking. If I just keep it simple and, and take it one day at a time, it's a lot like uh, uh, early recovery, you know. Right. Uh, I, I get I get along pretty good. Have you been doing any cooking or anything fun like that? Oh no, you don't want me to go there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a ham radio operator. I have been for a long, long time. That's kind of obsolete now. We're dinosaurs because of the internet. With shortwave radio, I can talk to people all over the world. That's pretty fun because I'm not a rock star. I'm just Joe when I do that. So that keeps me grounded a little bit. And, and a little at a time, I'm, I'm trying to write, write music. So let's talk about Vets Aid next week. Tell me okay. about the concert and why you're so dedicated to the cause. This will be the fourth year. The first three have been live venues uh, around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we have no choice but to go to virtual this year. It was a big scary monster at first, but keeping it simple, uh, you know, when you have a, a charity event, what you do is you humbly ask everybody you can think of. Mm -hmm. And you hope that three or four of them won't be on tour or won't be in the studio and they sign on. Well, I asked 30 people and they all said yes. So what I have is I'm going to be home. Drew Carey and I are going to MC it. But I'm going to be home in my living room and 30 musicians uh, from big guns to up and coming are at their house, home, on their couch, and they do acoustic songs with a message for the vets. And lo and behold, it's, it's, it's starting to get really neat with the assembly. The other thing is that uh, from the three years that we did live, we never streamed those shows. Uh, nobody saw them except the people that were at the concert. But we've got live live uh, footage from like Keith Urban, Zach Brown band, uh, Haim, James Taylor, Brad Paisley, Cheryl Crow, Jason Isbell. Uh, they said we could use some of their footage from the first three Vet Aid concerts. So that'll be interspersed with uh, uh, every, everybody playing a song on an acoustic guitar. And, and it's a lovely mix. Tell me about why you're so dedicated to veterans. I guess the foundation of it all is that I'm a gold star kid. My dad died when I was two. He was in the Army Air Corps before there was an Air Force. I have a stepfather who, who I love and who's always had my back. But uh, until I got a stepfather, you know, I, I just always wondered if my dad approved of me. I just missed my dad. I didn't have anybody to throw a ball with or uh, pick up as a role model. You know, he, he's always been my hero, but I'm resonant to gold star families and gold star kids. When uh, a loved one doesn't come back from
from the war, uh, it's an awful feeling. Yeah. I see the courage and, and, and the sadness that Gold Star families have. And I, I just couldn't help but feel part of it, you know? The other thing is that in, in, in touring around the country, I have come across between the coasts in the middle of the country, if you're a vet, like in Iowa, in a small town, nobody understands where your head's at. And, and nobody understands that you came back different than when you went. <laughs> but I have come across small vet run organizations interspersed through the Midwest run by vets that are like help centers or crisis centers or just a clubhouse and not isolating coming together seems to be strategic in keeping the vets from going dark and worse and these these little organizations are not funded they don't have a budget and so part of what what vets day does is to check them out make sure that they're real uh make sure that they're tax exempt and keep them going and across the board i think we need to pay more attention and be uh more active with our vets do you feel that people on the left need to know more about actual people overseas? I feel like it's a little abstract. We are in an ongoing forgotten war. Mm -hmm. We're at war. There's nothing about it on the media. The administration has totally ignored it. But we got kids, and I can call them kids now, because I hit the great 70s. Congratulations. Uh, they're, they're, they're going, and they're, put, they're in harm's way, and they're coming back damaged. Some of them hurt, and, and it's an ongoing thing, and we're pretending it's not there. There's priorities here with the COVID, and unemployment, I mean, things aren't rosy here. But besides that, we're at war. And when vets come home, they're coming home to this. And they and their families could use a little help or at least a thank you. Let's talk about your own life. I mean, do you have any guilt about not going to Vietnam? No. Yeah. No, I uh, I actually had a semester of ROTC in college, just in case. I had a a one F draft classification, and it's the Private Ryan Law. I am the sole surviving son in a family where my father was killed in active duty. And the movie Private Ryan is all about that. Uh, I was exempt because I'm the sole surviving son in the family. Uh, I would have rather gone to Vietnam and had my father. And I mean that sincerely. Yeah. I don't feel uh, guilty about going to Vietnam. What I feel guilty about is that my generation uh, was protesting the war and we wanted to bring the troops home. And that was totally misunderstood, misconstrued by the government to where the vets thought we didn't like them because they, they were killing people. And that wasn't the case. 
I, I've always felt bad and guilty about that. That's a shame that happened. And I was at Kent State. That's where I went to school. And we just wanted to bring the troops home, period. Something that was a bummer about this year is that you didn't get to do that event for the 50th anniversary of Kent State. Uh, I was really looking forward to it. But looking back, I mean, with all the craziness of this year, like how do you reflect on all of that? Well, I see uh, parallels to the division in the country. Mm -hmm. You know, there were the, the, the dirty long-haired hippies and there were the, uh, the other people. And now there's the left and right, that division. Uh, it's the same kind of tension and, and lack of understanding and refusing to bend, refusing to come into the middle and at least agree on stuff so you can get stuff done. And, and it makes me uneasy because that's back. And I thought we were over that. So there's a big parallel there. And that vibe makes me uh, really nervous because I know where it can go. When, when governors say, well, we're going to use the National Guard to stop this protesting. Whoa, that's not good because I know where that can go. And what happens, it's it's dysfunctional chain of command and the situation mutates and and anything goes anything goes and i hope that doesn't happen i think with the election we're going to slowly be able to turn it around and my hope is that we can Agree to disagree. That would be great. Yeah. And speaking of the election, one of my favorite things about you is that your run for president in 1980, you said that the new national anthem would be life's been good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I thought that would be good. Wouldn't that be good before a football game? We should still do it now. Uh, how, <laughs> would, how would your presidency have differed from Trump? I would have had a lot more fun than Trump. <laughs> I would, you know, Wednesday, I would just say, we're going to cancel Wednesday. We're going to go Tuesday right to Thursday <clears throat> to get to the weekend closer. I don't know. I'm, I'm kidding around. And what percentage of life's been good? What percentage of the stuff in that is real? It's all things that happen to me and, and my friends in what we do. A lot of it's real. I mean... I, I used to completely trash hotel rooms. I would not check out. I would leave. <laughs> I never had a Maserati. Um, I finally got one because everybody was making me feel really guilty. The look of sadness on their face when they <laughs> say, hey, Joe, do you really have a Maserati? And I say, <clears throat> Well, no, the look of, of just sadness in the fish. So I went and got a Maserati, okay? And I don't know if it does 185. I chickened out about 140. Yeah, I you know, too. I, I was going 140 and I had another gear left. And I figured, okay, 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 okay. Uh, and I didn't really lose my license. I lost my wallet, see? And my license was in it. So I took liberties um, with that song. But it's all things that happened in the grand movie of me and my peer group touring for 30 years. And what about Ordinary Average Guy? Did you really pick up dog shit in your backyard? Oh, yeah. Didn't you? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, when you're a rock star, okay, for two hours, you go on stage 
and you are so cool. You know, and everybody agrees. Boy, are you cool. And the other 22 hours, we're just, you know, we're just people. And we have to leave that rock star stuff on stage. We really do. Uh, so I grew up in Ohio and, and uh, my parents and grandparents were from Kansas. And I've done that drill growing up. And it's the salt of the earth. Uh, I, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it's America, really. That's what I was writing about. And, and I completely identify with that 22 hours out of the day. <laughs> and, 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 and I thought everybody, everybody could. And it's a great sing-along song when I play it live, I tell you. The whole audience is right there with me. <laughs> yeah. And I want to go to your past a little bit. Um, what advice would you give Joe Walsh in 1985? Uh, in 1985, uh, I had uh, problems with substance abuse, and I had lost my perspective, and I got sober in 1994, and it was the hardest thing I ever had to do. But I wish I had that time from 85 to 94. I wish I had that time back. Even before that, like in the 70s, was there one moment that was so wild that even by your standards, you looked back and you were like, that was really insane? Yeah. <laughs> Thousands of them. <laughs> um, hanging out with Keith Moon was, was uh, one of the highlights of my life, really, but it was absolutely terrifying at the time. Now it's funny. I just wanted to thank you for doing this. You know, my last concert before the pandemic was the Eagles at the Garden in New York. Oh, so you picked a good one. <laughs> it was, I, I had no idea, but I'm really glad I went. Well, you know, we, we were, that's the show that we were going to tour all of 2020 with. Mm -hmm. And know. we figured nobody will get a chance to see that this year. So we put it on the internet. And I'm I'm real proud of it, and uh, uh, there you go, one song after another, and and we did that so people would have something to watch. Yeah, it's definitely important. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. Me too. All right. Bye. Bye.